Page 6. After Man, A Zoology of the Future, by Dougal Dixon, 1981. Introduction by Desmond Morris. As soon as I saw this book, I wished I had written it myself. It is a marvelous idea, beautifully presented. Many years ago, as a young zoologist, I started inventing imaginary creatures, drawing and painting them as an enjoyable contrast to the demands of my scientific studies. Released from the restrictions of evolution as it really is, I was able to follow my own, private evolutionary whims. I could make monsters and strange organisms, plant growths and fabulous beasts of any color, shape and size I liked, letting them change and develop according to my own rules, giving my imagination full reign. I called them my biomorphs and they became as real to me as the animals and plants of the natural world. Dougal Dixon's mind has obviously been working in a similar way, although the creatures he has brought to life are very different from mine. Instead of inventing a parallel evolution, as though it were taking place on another world, he has given himself the intriguing task of contemplating a future evolution on our own planet, closely based on species that exist at present. By waving a time wand and eliminating today's dominant species, including man, he has been able to watch, through his mind's eye, the lesser animals gradually taking over as the major occupants of the Earth's surface. Setting his scenario in the distant future, about 50 million years from now, he has given the members of his new animal kingdom time to undergo dramatic changes in structure and behavior. But in doing this he has never allowed himself to become too outlandish in his invention. He has created his fauna of the future so painstakingly that each kind of animal teaches us an important lesson about the known processes of past evolution, about adaptation and specialization, convergence and radiation. By introducing us to fictitious examples of these factual processes, his book is not only great fun to read but also has real scientific value. The animals on these pages may be imaginary, but they illustrate vividly a whole range of important biological principles. It is this, the way in which he has perfectly balanced his vivid dreamings with a strict scientific discipline that makes his book so successful and his animals so convincing and, incidentally, so superior to the often ridiculous monsters invented by the cheaper brands of science fiction. The only danger in reading this delightful volume is that some of you may reach the point where you suddenly feel saddened by the thought that the animals meticulously depicted in it do not exist now. It would be so fascinating to be able to set off on an expedition and watch them all through a pair of binoculars, moving about on the surface of today's Earth. Personally, I feel this very strongly as I turn the pages and there is probably no greater praise that I can offer the author than that. Author's Introduction Evolution is a process of improvement. Hence, looking at the animals and plants of today and their interactions, the delicate balance between the flora, the herbivores and the meat-eaters, the precise engineering of the load-bearing structures of the giraffe's backbone, the delicate sculpting of the monkey's foot, enabling it to grasp objects as well as to climb trees, the subtle coloration of the puff adder's skin, hiding it completely among the dead leaves of the forest floor and trying to project all of that into the future is a near impossibility. For how can you improve upon perfection? One trend that is foreseeable, however, is the ruinous effect that man is having on the precise balance of nature. I have taken this not unjustifiably to an extreme, with man having extinguished the species that are already on the decline and having wreaked terrible destruction on their natural habitats before dying out himself and allowing evolution to get back to work, repairing his damage and filling in the gaps left behind. The raw materials for this reparation are the kinds of animals that do well despite, or because of, man's presence and which will outlive him those that man regards as bests and vermin. These are more likely to survive than are the highly modified and interbred domestic animals that he develops and encourages to suit his own needs. The result is a zoology of the world set, arbitrarily, 50 million years in the future, which I have used to expound some of the basic principles of evolution and ecology. The result is speculation built on fact.
what I offer is not a firm prediction, more an exploration of possibilities. The future world is described as if by a time traveler from today who has voyaged the world of that time and has studied its fauna. Such a traveler will have some knowledge of today's animal life and so he can describe things with reference to the types of animals that will be familiar to the reader. His report is written in the present tense as if addressed to fellow time travelers who have voyaged to the same period and wish to explore the world for themselves. Sit back, fellow time travelers, and enjoy the spectacle and drama of the evolution of life on your planet. Page 7